Thank you. Give it up for those two, right? Awesome. So, just so you all can see the entire story, the story in its entirety, I'm going to show a quick video and then we'll have a discussion around the video and we'll have some fun as well. So, here, check out this video real quick. Thank <laughs> you. 
I think I think I'll whisper in her ear because she knows she knows who the kid is. Yeah. So that that kid is going is, is like the entire first setup of this of this deal. Great. <laughs> Did you talk to Brian? I haven't talked to him. If I can, they're, they're, that kid they, they will be the hero okay. of the, the entire. Well, you go talk to Brian. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, real quick, Brian. So that first kid I was going to use that kind of ch backed out, chickened out. I was going to make them the hero of the entire assembly, and it kind of sets the entire presentation up. Need somebody else? Uh, all I need is like a, a small kid. If I can say request for a volunteer, and I'll, I'll just look for the, okay. the smallest one. That all right, I find sounds out. good. Okay. What size are you, John? Extra large or double X? Uh, XL. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Brian. You received the red flag signifying a foul. With the competition winding down, John finds himself in fourth place. What time are we done? Uh, okay, great. Awesome. So, silver secured. John refocuses on his original quest for gold. We're going to have to break a fresh world record to capture it. John's valiant attempts fall short. Christian takes the Paralympic long jump title, and though John registered didn't win gold, he returns home with silver and the satisfaction of never admitting defeat. Woo! Thank you so much. You know, every time I see that video, every time I see that video, I swear I'm going to win the gold medal. I just freak out on that all the time. So I'm going to do a little call response here. I'm going to say, what's possible? And you're going to come back and say, I'm possible. What's possible? I'm possible. What's possible? I'm possible. What's possible? I'm possible. And that's what I think the entire presentation is all about, because it's all about the possibilities of thinking that we can achieve greater than our expectations. For example, you saw when I was running with two legs and all of a sudden I'm running with one leg, I had to have a shift, a change in perspective. I had to switch the way I was thinking about things. And I was at the Paralympic Games in 1996. And I saw this gentleman as I was in the swim venue watching closed circuit television. I saw on the track this dude with this one leg, artificial leg, above the knee amputee who was on the long jump runway, and as the camera zoomed in on him, he began his run-up. And in the run-up with the long jump, everybody supports that athlete. So the crowd was beginning to clap for him, just like you're going to do right now, right? And he got on that long jump runway and began running leg over leg faster and 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 faster. And, faster. and he hit the takeoff board and he leapt into the air and at the apex, the height of his flight, his artificial leg flew off. I had never seen this before. And that long jumper landed in the sand here and his artificial leg landed about three feet up in front of him. And the entire crowd went dead silent, like you all are now. Remember that movie? Anybody seen the movie Home Alone? Yeah. Remember that scene, Macaulay Culkin? Everybody was like this. And that long jumper then turned back to the official and said, Say, man, where are you going to measure my jump from? From right here or where my artificial leg landed up there? And I said, wow, that is a great, a brilliant attitude to have because it's all about how we shift our perspective. Ed Weber, have you ever had a chance during this seventh and eighth grade year that you had to shift your perspective? That you began to set a goal that was 
maybe a little bit beyond your reach? Anybody ever had a chance to, to look at something with a different lens and say, you know what, I don't know if I can actually achieve that, but I believe that it is possible. So I want to do something real quick, and I'm gonna ask for one small volunteer to come up here. Well, to, you right there in the gray shirt, right there. Gray, yeah, gray shirt. Yep, yep, come on up here. Give her a hand, give her a hand, awesome. <laughs> Young lady, what is your name? Okay, this is Hannah. Everybody give Hannah a wonderful hand, a wonderful hand. I'm going to drop the mic, or actually I'm going to give the mic to Hannah just for one second because we're going to do a little counting game. Does everybody at Weber know how to count? Are you sure? All right, okay, hold on one second. Hold this mic real quick. I have in my possession three cones. I'm going to back up here to the long jump. Of the, I'm back up here to the... To the to the three-point line basketball. And we're gonna start at this three-point line. I'm gonna put the first cone right here. We're gonna simulate my longest jump when I was an athlete at the University of Arkansas. We're gonna count the steps, all right? About how long it is, and we'll see how long that is, okay? So this will be number, are you sure? Okay, number? All right, 27. <clears throat> now, Hannah, okay, 27 feet, two inches, longest jump in, in uh, college. Come here, Hannah. How many of you believe right now in this room that Hannah can jump that distance? Look at that, okay, we got, we got about 10%, 10%. How many say no freaking possible way is she jumping that far? <laughs> Hannah, they, they're not believing in you. They're not, they're, they're not, about 80% saying no, okay. So for those that had their hands up and raised that says, that say that Hannah cannot jump this distance, why can't she do it? Just raise your hand, I'm gonna call on you right there. Why can't she do it? Yes. She hasn't had any practice. Have you had any practice in this? Totally right, exactly right, it was Mundo. Okay, who else says something different? Yes, ma'am. I'm like two times taller than her, almost, yep, almost two times taller, good math, I like that. Halves, like in the back, all the way. She's not an Olympic athlete. She is not an Olympic athlete. Are you an Olympic athlete, Hannah? No. Do you board? No. No, she doesn't even board. Okay, all right, so not an Olympic athlete. Uh, why, one, more, one more reason, why? Uh, right there in the gray shirt here. See, does not have a running start. Does not have a running start. Do you have a running start? Nope. If you had a running start, could you jump that distance? Nope. You don't even believe in yourself. What is the matter with you? Okay, so remember what we did in the long jump before? How do we support each other? How do we support? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, come over here. Make your, make your arms real tight, okay? I got this for you. Thanks so much. Okay, come on here. All right. Hannah just jumped 27 feet, two and a half inches. Give it up. And for doing so, of course, we always get a prize. She has a nice one of my nice pens here, all right? Okay, so Hannah, would you please go sit back down for me? Thank you. Okay, so let's talk about that. 20% of you said no poss uh, that she could do it. 80% said no possible way. The 80% were wrong. Why were you wrong? Right there. What's that? Because 
there was a possible way. Yes. What happens? What was the way that Hannah got to the 27 feet? Yes. I did what? I carried her. I carried her. Do we, any, do we think that I was going, who thought I was going to carry her down there? Oh, cool. Now everybody thought I was going to carry her down there, right? Okay, right, right. Okay. Here's the deal. When we are thinking that something is not possible, we have to look around us to see who are our support elements, the people in our lives that are going to carry us, carry us the distance when we don't even think we can do it ourselves. Because sometimes in life, we don't think that things are possible because of the situation that might be, be before us. How many are boarders in here, snowboarders, right? First time you dropped into the half pipe, did you believe it was possible? Yes. Terrified up on top of the mountain. After you finish it, you believe it's possible. And I want to share with you, I did not know the possibilities that were in my life. I didn't know how deep they ran. So before I get into this next story, I have to define some terms for us. The first term is Olympic or Olympic at Olympian. Okay. So who knows what an Olympian is? Who an Olympian is? Okay. Let's uh, right there. What's who is an Olympian? Some of that was in the Olympics, right? Okay. Very good. What are the next games that are coming up for the Olympics? Where are they? South Korea, yes. Anybody know the city? Yes, sir. So, it is not in Seoul. That's a, good, that's a good guess, though. Yes, yes, sir. Pyeongchang, yes, exactly right. Pyeongchang is the name of the city. So the Winter Olympics are going to be there. Can anybody name an Olympian that has been named to the team already for Pyeongchang? Yes, sir. Who? Lindsey Vaughn. Has he been named to the team yet? I'm not sure if she has been, but Lindsey Vaughn is a great name. So the next term I need to define for you is Paralympian. Paralympian. Paralympians are athletes with physical disabilities and visual impairments. So they have amputations like myself. They might be wheelchair users. Uh, they could be blind. They could be folks with cerebral palsy. And we have all these type of individuals that are doing every type of sport that the Olympians are doing and more. They compete for gold, silver, and bronze medals. The next term I have to define for you is stigma. Anybody know what stigma means? Stigma. So stigma is something, go, yes, yes sir, or ma'am, I can't see you. Very good, it's kind of like a stereotype. And in this case, we're gonna say it's like a negative stereotype or a negative stigma that we might have against somebody. So with that, let me begin with my quick story here. In 2000, October 30th of 2000, I was sitting in an airport, in a gate waiting area in the San Francisco International Airport. I was reading a USA Today newspaper I was wearing shorts, which exposed my artificial leg. As I was sitting there, I began to hear this conversation that was happening about 20 yards off to my left, your right. Two boys, about five years old and seven years old, were talking to their mother and they had made a new discovery. Mommy, mommy, look at that guy's leg over there. See that guy's leg, look at the guy's leg. There goes Robot Man. <laughs> so I, I chuckled and laughed, but I went back to reading my USA Today newspaper. But then something else interesting happened. As I was reading that paper, I began to hear everyone else in the gate waiting area. They began to have this outer speak conversation that really should have remained inner speak conversation about the two boys, five and seven, who had just discovered Robot Man. <laughs> now, 
they had some negative stigma going on at that point. What do you think they were saying? Just yell it out. What do you think they were saying about the two boys? Rude, yes. Disrespectful, yes. Say it again. Wine? I, didn't hear, I, didn't, I can't hear what you, what you said. Oh, thinking why? Yes, why? And, and all the like. And they're saying, get those kids out of here. Shut them up and get them mom and move them around. And all those things. And I'm hearing all this, but I said, yeah, that's interesting. But I went back to reading my USA Today newspaper. And out of the corner of my eye, I look and I can see the woman get up with her two children and begin to walk in my direction. And I think she's going to do like a famous song and just walk on by. But no, oh, that's pretty good. I never got applause for that before. I will tell my wife tonight. I think they're gonna walk on by, but they don't. The, the lady, she stops and she leans in and says, excuse me, sir, my, my children, they are fascinated by your artificial leg. Uh, it looks like you've overcome so much adversity. It looks like you're such an inspiration. Would you please tell them what happened? No one has ever asked me in such a public setting what happened to my artificial leg and how I had that accident happen with all these other people now with this outer speak that should have remained inner speak now leaning in to listen to my answer. And in between her question and my response, I began to formulate what I was going to say to those two children. And in that space, I began to ask myself, did I really overcome adversity? Maybe I was just born this way. And did or am I truly an, an inspiration? I mean, I could be an ax murderer. I'm not, no. <laughs> yet. <laughs> and finally, you know, why are all these other people now leaning in? And in between her question and my response, I found my answer. I did not overcome the adversity of losing a leg. You see, six and a half years earlier, on May the 24th, 1994, I was lying in a hospital bed. My wife, Alice, was holding on to my, right, my left hand. My mom and dad were on the other side of the bed. And my little son, John Jr., who was about five years old at the time, was at the foot of the bed and the pain was more than I could bear. Dr. Randy Mullins walked into that hospital room with his white lab coat on, his clipboard in his hand. He said to me, uh, uh, Mr. Register, you, you have a tough choice to make. You can either keep your leg and use a walker or a wheelchair for the rest of your life, or I can amputate your leg and you can use a prosthesis for the rest of your life. Now, what kind of, cho what kind of choice is that? You see, six, seven days earlier, May 17th, 1994, I was on top of the world. You saw it in the video. I was one of the fastest hurdlers in the world. Top 20 in the world, top eight in the US, and I was on my way to make the Olympic team. I was running the 400 meter hurdles on the Army's world class athlete program team. It's a program that allows a soldier to compete for the Olympic Games just prior to the next games, and I was on that prestigious program. I was fresh out of the Gulf War and was trying to make my dreams possible. And as I got off the bus, I began to do my warm up in the 400 meter hurdles. Now the 400 meter hurdles is one lap all the way around the track. There's about a 45 meter lead in to that race. And every hurdle after that is about 35 meters apart, 10 barriers that I must get over. I am moving over each barrier at a speed of about 8.6 meters per second, which for Weber here and uh, the Panthers, that equates to what? 
Your math teacher told me y'all were fast. Uh, so somebody said fast, that's exactly right, fast. <laughs> it's about just shy of 19 miles an hour. Three more miles per hour and they would give me a ticket going through your Weber School District right here because the speed limit is 21 miles per hour. So as I was practicing and going over these hurdles, the wind was blowing very hard in Hayes, Kansas. And I was trying for my best to get onto my right leg, which was my dominant leg all the time, but I'm ambidextrous, so I was going left leg and right leg. And sometimes in hurdles, as in life, we just want things to stay the same. But the wind's blowing, I am having problems. I can't get my steps right. So I did one last pass and I jumped out of the blocks and I approached that first hurdle and my right leg was coming up. Boom, I said, I'm on, I'm, it's just golden. The second hurdle came up, took my 13 steps to that approach. I felt the wind push against me. I pushed back against that Kansas wind and my right leg, right leg came up again. Boom, I'm still on. When I approached the third hurdle, I felt that Kansas wind push against me one more time. I pushed back hard against the Kansas wind, tried to increase my tempo, but I realized I was gonna be short. So like I've done a thousand times before, I was gonna take the hurdle with my left leg, run out of it, reset, and try it again. But this time when I launched off my right leg, threw my left leg across the top of the hurdle, snapped it back down to the ground to run out of the barrier and off the barrier to the next hurdle, Instead of moving forward, I heard a sound. I heard <laughs> and my body sailed through the air. As my body twisted in my descent to the ground, I saw my left shin pass in front of my face. My shoulders hit the ground and I bounced to a halt. I did a quick once over my body, you know how it is when you get hurt or something, you kind of assess yourself. I looked, felt my head, I was okay, my shoulders okay, my waist okay. When I saw my knee, my patella had risen three inches up my femur bone and my left leg was now canted across my right leg with the tip of my shoe touching the surface of the track. I'm gonna step off the track just for a second because I need you to understand what this accident was doing and what it looked like for me. So I'm going to show it, but however, if you are a little bit squeamish, you can avert your eyes right now. It'll be on the screen for about two minutes and I'll, and I'll remove it. So if you don't want, I know that seventh and eighth graders are, don't like seeing stuff like this. And I'll explain it. So on the bottom, you can see my toe, my toenail on my, on my left foot, the ankle, and if you come up, you will see the head of the femur bone pushing out from where the knee is. The patella is to the left and up about three inches dislo dislocated. My head is all the way down here. It actually, the leg looks like an elbow. All right? So let me step back onto the track. With my leg canted in that position, the only thing I could think about was just get up. Just push yourself up, Don. Come on, just get yourself up. Push yourself up. Don't, don't, don't. Ah! Oh, God! And then 90 minutes later, now my teammates, they were very concerned about me and coming over to offer help. But 90 minutes later, as they began to sing songs and hymns to keep me calm, 90 minutes later, the ambulance came. And I was put in the back and I was rushed <laughs> off to Hayes, Kansas Medical Center where another doctor in a white lab coat came in 
and looked at me and said, Mr. Register, looks like you got a bit of a problem. I'm going to have to fix that. So that doctor got two orderlies and he bore down on that crooked leg. We're going to do this on three. One. <laughs> and my leg ballooned up. And I passed out. I don't remember too much about what happened next. I don't remember being loaded in the medevac and being flown over to the hospital in Wichita, Kansas at the Wesley Medical Center. I don't remember when my wife came in or my son or my parents. I don't remember too much about Dr. Randy Mullins, but I do remember lying in that bed in the most excruciating pain of my life with my wife Alice holding on to my left hand and my parents on the opposite side of that bed and my son John Jr. at the foot and Dr. Randy Mullen saying, you got a tough choice to make. And it was the pain that actually spoke first because my male deductive reasoning said, get rid of the leg, get rid of the pain. So I turned to Dr. Mullins, I said, I know it has to be amputated. And as soon as I spoke those words, my wife Alice, her hand slipped away from mine. My parents, they both went to the other side and opposite sides of the bed uh, and, and the room. And my son, John Jr. really didn't know too much was going on. And Dr. Randy Mullins said, all right, we'll, we'll, we'll begin uh, tomorrow night. And when I woke up from that surgery, I was lying in the bed, I could see it was 11.30 p.m. at night because there was this little black and white clock with a second hand that was still spinning around. All these things were hooked up to me and these, these monitors. And I was in more pain than my male deductive reasoning had reasoned. And as I looked down at those white sheets, I could see my, left, my right leg clearly, but where my left leg was, there was just an impression and I began to rethink my decision about making the amputation. <laughs> I remember the nurse said, you know, if you have a lot of pain, just reach over, there's a little morphine drip button there, and you just press that button down, and, out, and, and you'll be able to get that morphine drip to, to come knock some of that pain away. I could see the button, but I was so weak from that operation, I couldn't even roll over to depress the button. I could see out my room door to the nurse's aid station and if I could just get their attention I could get them in to maybe depress the button or give me some relief from this pain and agony I was in but when I started to call out those tubes that had been down my throat made the sound too inaudible to get their attention so there I lay in that bed for the next seven hours with my dangerous thoughts. Who am I now? What, what, what's my identity? Is my wife going to stick around? Is my son still gonna see me as his dad? Do I still have a job in the army? Can I support my family? My Olympic dreams are over. It was in about 7.30 that Dr. Randy Mullins walked into the room. He took one look at me and saw that my countenance had shifted 180 degrees. He knew I was experiencing a mental loss that was happening right there and I was having this negative stigma come all over me. So he called for my wife Alice who was at the hotel trying to manage herself, my son John Jr., me, and her mother-in-law. And she came rushing over and it took them 45 minutes to get me out of that bed into a wheelchair to wheel me outside by doctor's orders to an inaccessible playground. And as I was parked in that chair, I was sitting there forced to watch my wife and my boy play on a swing set about 20 yards away from me. And I lost it. 
I broke down uncontrollably, started heaving and sobbing because I couldn't get myself out of that chair 20 yards just to play with my son. My wife, Alice, saw me struggling and she comes running over to me and says, what's going on? What is wrong? And I began to articulate to her every single thing I was thinking about the night before. And then she said the words that stopped my downward spiral. She became that support system and undergirded me and she said, you know what, John? We're gonna get through this together. It's just our new normal. It's just our new normal. And when I heard those words, I began to think about the possibilities of what a new normal life can provide for us. And I saw my son, John Jr., he jumps off the swing at five years old, hits the deck, comes running over those twins. Daddy, daddy, you see my jump? Daddy, you see my jump, daddy? And he jumps up and jumps into my lap. And in those 20 yards, he had just validated me as his father. And he had just created his new normal. And I realized that's what I had to do. To begin that belief system, to, to get back up again, I had to create that new normal. So, I folded up my USA Today newspaper and I placed it down by my side. And I looked back at the woman with her two boys and I said, I think I did not overcome the adversity as you think I, I did. Because if I overcame my amputation, I would have my leg back. I don't. I think what I overcame was three, were three things. The first was negative stigma, my personal negative stigma, what I thought about myself. What do you think about yourself? How do you value yourself and the things and the goals and the opportunities that you want to reach for, that you want to see? I had this negative stigma that it was not going to be possible. The second thing was the negative stigma of others. That's the second thing I overcame. Because oftentimes we place on others what we believe they can or cannot achieve based upon what they can achieve if they were the person that was the amputee. How does that relate? We see our friends or we see those that we associate with and we do not think it was possible. Just like Hannah, when we looked at the, the, the long jump. And we look, go into our mind saying, I could never do that, so therefore Hannah could never do that. And we place on them what we believe for them they could or could not do based on what we believe we could or could not do if we were the person in that situation. But I think the greatest thing that I had to overcome in stigma was why those stigmas were there in the first place. What interloper what person, what was I listening to that was telling me that I could not be possible? Who do you listen to? Who is in your circle of friends that tell you that it's not possible? You'll never be able to do that. I challenge you, we would call on the west side of Chicago, to 86 of those folks from your life. Only surround yourself with individuals that are going to push you to the next level. And I began to do exactly just that. So the woman asked me, well, what happened next? And I said, I'm so glad you asked. I said, I started swimming for physical therapy. And I got so fast in the water that 23 months later, I wound up making the Paralympic swim team. And I thought it was kind of funny because I went from this 400 meter hurdler to an African American swimmer. And in my book, we just didn't do that sport too much. And it was at those games I saw an athlete on the long jump runway, and he won that long jump medal, and I saw his leg fly off, and I decided to have a leg made for running, and 
And four years later, I wound up going to those games and win the silver medal. It was on October 23rd, 2000. She says, oh my gosh, that was just seven days ago. And I said, I know. And I just happened to have that silver medal in my pocket. And I brought it out. And I hung it around that little boy's neck. Would you come up here real quick? You'd be that little boy. What's your name? Eden. Eden. I put it right around his little neck. Show your classmates there. Look, he can't even hold, he can't, look at that. Whoop, whoop, whoop. <laughs> and then I took it off and I hung it around his the other brother's neck. What's your little name? Come here. Yeah. What's your name? AJ. AJ. And I hung it around AJ's neck. I'm a little boy. <laughs> and then I took it off his neck and I quickly put it back in my pocket. Give them both a hand. You guys get a, a pin too. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for helping. And there was this whole thing about all of what I had learned, and I was beginning to, and the, the, as a woman thanked me for my time, because the most amazing thing happened, she thanks me for my time. She shakes my hand, asks for an autograph, and off they walk back to 20 yards to their seat. And I said, what just happened? Well, she took a risk and came over. She had validated my support network, and she forced me to give an answer. But everyone in the gate waiting area, their conversations changed to how cool is that? Did you hear that story? That was amazing. Those two kids' lives will never be the same. And that's where this inspirational value began to overtake me. That just because I was sitting in a seat in an airport wearing shorts, somebody was being inspired. We all need support networks to help us push through. What then are some of the ways that we can adjust our proverbial ropes to allow things to become more possible for us? Somebody give me an answer. What are some of the ways we can adjust? Yes, sir. Yes, you can write down things in a journal. So that's kind of self awareness and you can see what you can do to be more possible for the next day. Somebody else have a different answer? Over there. Practice for what? Practice to get used to it. Yes, I believe that one of the things that we can do, that's a very good answer in, in practicing, is that we have, there's a three stages in the word, um, in the first letter of the word resilience. Resilience is kind of either the bounce back or you're getting back up, you overcome a situation and you are fighting back. And I think the first thing that we have to do, actually the second thing, the first thing we have to do is that with inside the word resilience resides the word silence. So we must become silent first. The second thing then is we have to develop some type of a ritual, which we just heard, and that ritual develops our rhythm, and that rhythm elevates us to our rise. And so we can overcome those obstacles that are in our life to help us be more resilient and become more possible. Because what's possible? What's possible? Exactly right. And I want to illustrate this one more time of what is possible and I'm possible, uh, because I think I... First, I had to overcome those obstacles in my life, and I, just because I was an amputee didn't mean I really got it. I didn't understand the value and the benefits of being a person with a disability. So as I was sitting in another gate waiting area, another airport, this time in the Washington Dulles Airport, I was looking at my new teammates. I had just made the Paralympic swim team. In the Paralympic swim team, there were about 30 of us on that team, and I was in this gate waiting area with track and field athletes and basketball players, wheelchair basketball players. But the only thing I could see, because I was a new amputee, were people with disabilities. And it was a negative shot to my mind and my eyes because these people were blind, they were paralyzed, they were little people, they were people with cerebral palsy, and they were amputees. And in fact, I was sitting next to a gentleman who was in a three-piece, beautiful Armani suit. He had beautiful gator skin shoes on. He was pulling a Louis Vuitton bag, and he was talking so loud on his cell phone, I just wanted to reach out and touch him. But I didn't keep my hands to myself. 
and I was in the stupor of being, what's the value and the benefit of being on this Paralympic team? I wanted to be on the Olympic team, not the Paralympic team. So anybody fly in here? Anybody been on a plane before? Oh, that's, wow, that's a lot. <laughs> so <clears throat> what's the first category of people that get to board the aircraft first? Say again. Yeah, so you got, before first class comes people with, say again, minors? Yeah, minors and people with disabilities, exactly right. So the gate agent, she gets up to the lectern with her little perky self and she says, ladies and gentlemen, flight number 300 is now ready for passenger boarding. Will everyone who needs a little more time and assistance please get up and board the aircraft at this time? So 60 of my Paralympic teammates, all with disabilities, and I got up and began to walk down the jet bridge. And I said, oh, oh, oh that's benefit number one. That's a perk. I'm in front of all the first class flyers. I sit down on seat 14F. I like my seat, I like the window seat, and I'm watching all my teammates board this aircraft. The people with cerebral palsy who are ambulatory walkers, they are using the backs of the chairs to get to their seat. Those that are blind are being led on by their teammates to get to their seats. Those who are in wheelchairs are using aisle chairs and being pulled to their seats. And then I see tree. Now, Tree is a wheelchair basketball player. He is a bilateral amputee, meaning both legs are missing below his knees. But Tree stands six feet, eight inches tall. But I get it. He can be a tree at six, eight, or a stump at four, three, depending upon which legs he picks out of his closet in the morning. And Tree, now having those stilt legs on, sits down in seat seven C, and he pops his artificial legs off hands them to the flight attendant, who then places his legs in the overhead bin. But I get it, benefit number two. He's got more leg room. <laughs> Tree's now 4'6", and the flight attendant comes over and says, can I help you with anything else, sir? Do you need any more time and attention? Tree says, no, ma'am, I'm good, I'm good. And off the flight attendant walks back to the curtains into the first class cabin to get all the ABs on board the aircraft, all the able bodies. The next thing that happens is Tree, in seat 7C, jumps up into his seat. He's now 4'6", and he takes his long basketball arms, hoists himself up to the overhead bin, lays prone next to his legs, closes the bin door. 14F. I catch eyes with Amy, my swim teammate. Amy puts her head down, twiddles her thumbs like they have done this a thousand times before. And I'm on the edge of my seat. Who's gonna sit in that seventh row? Who's gonna sit in that seventh seat? People are going to the back of the plane. They're going to the front of the plane. They're sitting all over the place. And then we have our winner, <laughs> Mr. Armani Suit. Still pulling that Louis Vuitton bag. He stops at the seventh row and his attache case will not fit comfortably underneath the seat back pocket in front of him, so he must go to the overhead bin where our friend Tree has been lying prone for the last five minutes. And when he goes to lift that latch, Armani picks his, that latch, the latch, boom, out Tree pops, jump just like you did, ma'am. And Armani goes from the seventh row, jumps with one leap all the way back to the 14th row where I'm at, Papers all over the place, and I catch eyes back with Amy. Amy says, oh, that's pretty good, John. <laughs> Last guy on the major, row 10. <laughs> New world record. <laughs> Armani picks all this stuff up, goes back to that seventh row, and Tree now has his hand on his chin, and those little legs of his are crossed. And he says, I'm sorry, sir, but this overhead bin space has been filled. I am cracking up back in 14F. But I thought about it as I'm laughing and my teammates are laughing, how many times they have done this over and over again. And I thought about how I had devalued in the gate waiting area my new teammates. Because I wanted to be on the Olympic team, not the Paralympic team. 
but it looked like I was going to have a lot more fun on the Paralympic team than I ever was going to have on the Olympic team. And I began to believe for myself what was possible. Because Armani and myself in that case were kind of lower than the attitudes and beliefs that my new teammates had about themselves. And Tree was on top. He believed and identified with inside of himself because he knew it was possible. I want you to take a look at this last video here and understand what is possible for individuals with disabilities. What do you think about that one? <laughs> that gives me chills every time I just see it about what is possible. So what did you see that just kind of blew you away? Just give me one thing that you may have seen that in that video. Yes, sir. Playing the guitar with your feet. Playing the guitar with your feet. Totally rad, right? Yes, ma'am. Say it louder for me. Flying an airplane helicopter with your feet, right? Crazy, craziness. Yes, ma'am. Yes. You're thinking about why well, I wish I could fly an airplane? Right, and she's doing it with her, just like her feet. That's just kind of craziness. One more, on the back. Yes, sir. Yes. Driving a, racing a car with your feet like that. And the gentleman that was in the video, his name is Matt Stutzman, who was shooting archery with his feet. He has the longest accurate shot of anyone in the world, longest shot with a bow and arrow. And when you ask him, how do you do that with your feet? Matt Stutzman, who has no arms, he says, well, John, everybody knows that the best archers 
shoot with their feet. It is a total perspective shift, like we were saying earlier. Why do the best archers shoot with their feet? Because Matt Stutzman is the best archer in the world with the longest shot. That's why. So we see what is possible. We see the support elements in that activity, that rope activity of how we need firm foundations and that's critical. We see how we need to kind of 86 those around us that are not believing in our dreams and surrounding ourselves with those individuals that can push us because it's all collectively comes together under one countenance, underneath one roof in our lives.